Well, I had uh, I had been working at times with Nelson Riddle, marvelous arranger, and he did that early stuff at Capitol with Frank Sinatra. When Frank took over Reprise Records, I was Nancy's drummer. We had already, uh, I mean, not long after Reprise Records, we did Boots Are Made for Walking and some wonderful things, and Frank wanted the Wrecking Crew. Now, I knew Frank. I had spent some time at his home down here in, in, uh, in the desert with Nancy and her mom, and uh, I sort of became a part of that family many years ago. Back through in the, Tommy, correct? Through, Tommy. through, through the, the young man, Tommy Sands. Uh, Tommy and Nancy fell in love, got married. You know, they had a 15-minute Hollywood marriage, and unfortunately, then it was over with. But I then Nancy decided she wanted to sing, and she asked, her former husband's drummer, and I became her drummer man. And we did lots of records. Well, then when Frank saw the sales and when he heard the records, we were not just a bunch of rock and roll kids. <laughs> we were doing everybody. And Frank realized that he wanted part of that bandwagon. And we went in and we did some, you know, just some beautiful records with Frank Sinatra. He had just married... The little gal, the little actress, um, Mia, Farrow? Mia Farrow. Frank Sinatra had just married Mia Farrow. And Frank used to come in the studio, you know, with this entourage of Sarge Weiss and, and uh, what's his name? The guy Jimmy. that owned the, the guy that owned the restaurant, uh, Jilly. Jilly Nusso or something like that. Jilly, uh, Frank's entourage would come in, and Frank would come around, say hello to each and every one of us somehow, and throw us a wink and say, let's make a record, and then he'd go, and we'd do it. The Sinatra sessions were wonderful because it was always called a double session, six hours with an hour in between. So we would, the first three hours was just rehearsing the music, and the engineers going through every microphone, double, triple checking, make sure that none of the chairs were squeaking, that the string players were sitting in or any of the players. Nobody wanted to have any kind of a glitch in the Frank Sinatra date. Because a lot of times you're doing a session and something squeaks, you know, they hold it, let's do another one. They didn't work that way with Mr. Sinatra. Frank came in, he was ready, to, he knew what he was going to do. And he expected everyone the same way. Well, we would always take a, a one-hour break in between. They would double, triple-check all the lines, all the microphone lines, plug-ins, make sure that there were, there were no shorts, nothing broken. And then we would have an hour break for coffee or a sandwich or something. And then we would be back in the studio in our seats, and Frank would walk in maybe 10 minutes after the hour, and as I said, he'd walk around and he'd say, hey, Blaney, and say hello to, you know, various people that he knew. He didn't know everybody. And then he would walk in a booth with his entourage. Then he would walk out alone. He'd say, let's make a record. And that was it. We did, you know, Strangers in the Night was his only gold single. Well, he sold many millions of records, mm -hmm. but this was the one that really pushed him over to the top again. Strangers in the Night uh, was one of them, and we did um, That's Life. Life. It was another killer record. It was a great record, one of my favorites. Uh, 